Hello, welcome to our monthly webinar series. I'm Sharon Urias and I'm here with Justin McNaughton. Today, we're going to talk about the Trademark Modernization Act and how to confirm you're properly using your trademarks in commerce. For those of you who don't know us, Justin is a trademark prosecutor and I am a trademark litigator. Please feel free to submit your questions during the webinar in the question and answer box. We will get to all of your questions at the end of the webinar. So Justin, let's get started. So we thought we'd start out with a dramatic reading of the Trademark Modernization Act of 2020. Um, we, you wanna get that started, Sharon? No, probably not. I think that would take longer than the uh, 30 minutes that we have set aside for today. So instead, I think what we'll do is we'll talk about some of the highlights of the act, and then we'll talk about the practical considerations and um, regarding use in commerce. So the first major change um, to trademark law in the United States. And by the way, this came into um, enactment December 27th, 2020, and it was sort of crammed through as part of the coronavirus relief package. So I'm not sure a lot of people even realized that this was happening, um, at least the people who weren't, weren't closely paying attention to that particular bill. But one of the major changes is with respect to infringement actions under the Lanham Act. Um, one common type of relief that plaintiffs seek who are alleging infringement is a temporary restraining order or preliminary injunction, which basically means that you're asking the court to issue an order to prevent the infringer from using the competing mark or the um, uh, infringing mark. And for years, there has been a split in the uh, circuit courts as to whether a plaintiff is entitled to a presumption of irreparable harm. Now, in order to obtain an injunction, I don't wanna to get too technical here, but in order to get an injunction, one of the requirements is to establish that if you don't get the injunction, you will suffer irreparable harm. So according to the TMA, um, the plaintiff goes into the, um, goes into the case with a rebuttable presumption of irreparable harm, which in theory should make it easier to get an injunction. In my opinion, though, I'm not sure that it's really going to have a, a large impact. Um, I, I don't know that, you know, for one thing, there's already a number of circuits that have this rebuttable presumption. And the TRA, excuse me, the TMA itself doesn't specify whether the presumption then shifts the burden of proof to the defendant to prove that, um, you know, as, as to the um, burden of proof or whether it's just the burden of production. If it is just the burden of production, then all the defendant has to do is, you know, present evidence um, to rebut the presumption and then the presumption just goes away. So it sounds like it might not be that, you know, that groundbreaking. No, I don't think it really is. Honestly, I think that it's going to get a lot of plaintiffs lawyers pretty excited because now that's just one more element that they uh, can go into court saying, yes, we have a presumption, um, just as with a federal registration, you have a presumption that you have rights to your trademark, but the other side still can present evidence to challenge that uh, presumption. So it would, it would eventually go away. So, so, so it's possible that in some situations it might reduce the cost of enforcement, but in other, but in a lot of situations, it'll be kind of the same. I, I just don't think it's going to have that great of an impact on litigation as a whole, but it remains mm -hmm. to be seen. This has just come into effect. Yeah. So, I mean, a couple other things that happened from this act that I'm hopeful have a dramatic effect, we'll see, are um, related to, the, there's been this phenomenon of fake trademarks in, um, over the last five, 10 years. And where there are all sorts of people have been filing um, trademarks from all over the world and and uh, not necessarily following. Fake? Do you mean they're not? So, well, so in the US, we have this, we're actually kind of unique. In the US, you have to be using a trademark in commerce. You have to actually be selling whatever it is you say you're selling to have a valid trademark registration and to maintain a trademark. That's not true in a lot of countries. Um, in many countries, you just pay your money and the government's like, here you go. And that's it. And so there's some confusion. And so people had been filing from overseas um, these trademarks in the US and, and just <laughs> like doctoring. I mean, 
you know, taking a, a photograph of something and then just photoshopping on the, the trademark and then sending it through and saying, yep. And then, and the trademark office traditionally, you know, being, you know, a very buttoned up organization would take the, take the stance that, well, they're signing a sworn oath, you know, a sworn declaration. So this must be true. And we end up with a whole bunch of these trademark registrations. Um, I actually had a, a, a like a classic example of this, I had a, a fun client. She wrote children's books and and um, went through. We filed the trademark application. Sure enough, this registration was cited against us, and it was. Um, I mean, it was it was clearly fake. Um, and we reached out, and they tried to extort money from us. And you know, the, this lady, we had to go through the whole concept. Right now, you have to institute almost a mini litigation to get rid of these trademarks. And so, you know, she she's an author. She's like, I don't really want to like get into litigation over this. Like, I don't want to, you know, if they respond that I'm in this fight. And finally went forward. Sure enough, you know, went through the proceeding, got the other mark canceled and got her trademark through. But but it's it's just it's an, annoying and it's expensive. Right. Yeah. So, and so the, many of the people who are maybe what you're saying is submitting fake specimens. So they take a picture of a t-shirt with a fake hang tag on it and claim that they're really selling merchandise under that brand when they really right. are. Exactly. And that's exactly what was happening. So, and uh, you know, not to pick on a, a country, but there was one study, some NYU um, professors had done a study and found that like, it was something like 70% of, of trademarks in the US that had originated from China were fake. And, and there are lots and lots of them. So, and the, the one that we ran into happened to also have been originated in China, but, um, but it, it happened from lots of places, just I think because of differences in, um, in the rules. So they, you know, the trademark office tried one thing, which was they instituted a rule that only US trademark attorneys could file. And then people started impersonating US trademark attorneys, you know, and filing things. It's like, okay, that didn't work. Um, and- Were they lie to their US trademark attorneys? What's that? Or they lie to their U.S. trademark attorney, attorney? Yeah, yeah. Or they lie to them exactly. But but the 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 crazy ones were the ones that actually just signed it, and so they found somebody's info and like, here you go. Um, so we have these new procedures, and what's what's interesting about them? Traditionally, all of the remedies available were were these. They call them inter partes which means you have to be in there as a party. It's more like litigation where you have a plaintiff defendant kind of thing to cancel somebody's registration or to even oppose it. These new proceedings, one is called an expungement and one is called a re-examination. And we're not gonna get into all of the nuances. The rules aren't even out yet on these, but the basic idea is that, you know, if you, if you run into one of these and you know that it's fake, you can sort of throw the match, pay the fee, and then the the trademark office will handle it all and you don't have to get your hands dirty. That's kind of the, the, the way that these work. Right. And there's um, also situations where you might have a client who comes to you and says, I, I want to use this particular mark. And then you do some research and you find a registration for a competing mark, but then you do more research and you realize the company hasn't been using it for five or 10 years. So what do you do? You know, now it sounds like it's going to be easier to get rid of that mark without actually having to challenge it um, through the, you know, inter-party proceedings process. Right. And that's what we're hopeful for. So, um, you know, and, and not, we're not going to get, we don't have a time to get into all the nuances about these two proceedings. Mm -hmm. You know, in some ways they're, they're a little, they overlap a little, but they are also different. But you know, a couple of things about them, like we just said, one party can institute and it doesn't even have to, it can be anyone. So um, anybody can kick off one of these proceedings. You're, you'll have to file a petition. You'll have to do some sort of reasonable investigation. And I don't know what that's going to look like. The trademark office is going to tell us, but some investigation to see that, yes, you know, that you can show this, this prima facie case that they're not using it or or it, for one of them that you they've never used it, and then you're the going to have to pay a fee. An opportunity to respond to it. Yeah, so the, that's one part is the owner is always going to have a chance to respond, and the owner, but it will be the owner to the office. Mm -hmm. It won't be the owner to you, which had been in the past. So you won't have to expend the fees, um, kind of fighting back and forth. Um, so those are the basics of it. You know, there 
there are a few some nuances about the differences um and honestly I, they they over i think they overlap quite a bit um it will be interesting in practice to see if the fees are dramatically different and you know there are differences in when you can file the two um so for uh, for uh, re-examination, you can only file during the first five years, but for expungement, you can only file starting at the third year anniversary up to 10 years. So it's, you know, there's some, there's some strange things in there that are, are um, that are differences, but. Um, well, it's also interesting, Justin, that anyone can file these, right? I mean, you don't have to have standing. It, to show that you are that you would be harmed by the registration isn't that right right like in a way it's almost and they, they have these there are some similar things in the on the patent side of the office but in a way this is almost like a whistleblower kind of thing where you 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 do all the research and you put it all together and you pay the fee and then the office looks at it and if the office decides you know that's right then the office will instate this proceeding and then the office will cancel or expunge or re-examine the trademark. So it's really interesting. I mean, it'll be interesting yeah. to see, you know how there are some websites that target trademark trolls and they, it'll be interesting to me to see if those websites then decide to take it upon themselves right. to initiate these proceedings. Um, right, like maybe if, you know, if there's, if they identify somebody who's doing a lot of these, right? Maybe they'll they'll figure out some way to, to knock all of their their trademark registrations down. Yeah, who knows? It'll be interesting. Um, It'll be interesting. So another another one that popped up, and this one I was a little bummed about. So there's this been this kind of obscure, little known procedure where, all you know, for years and years, you could file what's called a letter of protest, and this was where you you saw that somebody was regist trying to register something, and for whatever reason, it was gonna it was gonna hurt you, or you didn't feel like they should have it, where you could basically write a letter to the trademark office and list out all the references and the, and the, the, and you had to be careful about it and you just send it in and they didn't really hear anything back. Um, sometimes, sometimes that, you know, they would send you like a little confirmation, but you didn't know what happened until you'd go and look at the registration or the application later and see if, if it got cited in their, their office action. So it was kind of this cool way that you could, you know, intervene, but nobody would know, it was your secret weapon. Yeah, it was like this kind of secret weapon. And now, now they formalized it and they're charging a fee. So, um, but, but it is still, it's useful. I, I actually like that it's a formal process because you were always a little bit afraid of like, well, what if they never pick this up? Like, there's no real process. You're just like, here you go. And sending um, a letter to the void and hoping that yeah. something happens with it. But, you know, and I've had good luck with them in the past. So this is one where, you know, sometimes it helps because you can avoid an opposition proceeding, right? Which is kind of expensive and you can just make sure like, hey, just in case you don't know this about this this area, you, you know, take a look at this and they'll give it to the, they would send it to the examiner without telling them who you were. Um, although you can often figure out who it was, so. So now all of this is to say that if you have a trademark registration, you need to be, using it in commerce, you need to make sure that you are using it in the right way in commerce as well, right? For sure, because in there, we didn't talk about this, but there's another one that's been introduced. There's a new grounds for can cancellation and that's cancellation is a two party proceeding, but it's a new grounds where like, hey, they never used it um, and they're not using it. So that's a grounds for cancellation. So yeah, so you, as, a, as a trademark owner, you wanna be careful that you are actually using your trademark and, and commerce. And it's um, because if you're not, and you've got these problems in there, you can, you can create some headache for yourself if you get into a fight. So for goods, you wanna make sure that you're using it on the container, on the hang tag. For clothing, I always tell people it's on the inside label that you really need to worry about, not so much what's being displayed on the front of the shirt. Um, I think goods is a little bit more yeah. conceptually easy for people to understand. Yeah, the most, I mean, the most common for goods is actually just to have it printed on the thing itself. Like my computer here has got a, you know, it's, it's engraved in the computer itself. So that's the right. most common way for goods. Um, but 
And then services is a little bit trickier, I think, or a little less obvious for people to understand. Yeah. So what do you the, recommend the irony being that it's far easier to show use in commerce for services because it's more flexible, but it is a little bit harder for people to understand like how you show a service with a trademark. But but it's anything like uh, you know your website. So like gmlaw.com is our website, and you go there, and it's very clear that we provide legal services, um, and that's that's all you need to do, you know? I mean, well, I say that the, the critical part is you actually have to be providing legal services. So if we had a really nice website, but we didn't actually provide legal services, that's the situation where, where your trademark is vulnerable. So you have to actually be doing what you say you're doing in that, in that registration. So um, what are some other ways service providers can demonstrate use in commerce? So uh, brochures, um, let's see, um, I mean, even a billboard, you know, any type of thing that you're, that you're showing to other people or that you are, um, promotional materials, yeah, promotional materials, anything, it just has to have your trademark and your trademark has to, you know, prominently be there and associated with a description of all the services. But again, the key is you have to be providing those services. So if you, right. you can't just like put your brochure out there, but you haven't actually you're not a capable like say you're not licensed yet right that doesn't work you can't because you cannot provide the services yet well and the interesting thing also is that you need to make sure that your use actually matches what the class of goods or services is that you've filed so um, for example if you have a bakery shop where you're selling muffins and cookies and whatnot um, but your registration is that you're providing say catering services um, for delivery of baked goods. That is similar, right. but it doesn't match exactly, right? Right, and that'll happen. So what'll happen is say, say when they first got started, they were like, oh, we're gonna be this, you know, delivery service for donuts or whatever, and then move forward 10 years and that didn't really work out. Now it's just a traditional donut shop. Well, if you filed for the delivery, then yeah, you're technically not doing what's in your registration. So you need to either figure out a way to fix that, file a new registration, do something to clean that up so that, because in that situation, you might actually be subject to cancellation, even though you do have rights in the trademark, but you want to, you want to have that, you know, that, that really buttoned down. And people don't now, necessarily realize that. I mean, I guess that comes into play also with clothing, right? Because maybe you have a grand idea and you want to sell t-shirts, hats, bags, gloves, uh, but then, as it turns out, the only thing you're selling is T-shirts. So right. if you have all those items listed in your registration, are you subject to cancellation then? So so that's the, I mean, and that is a good example because for apparel, apparel is one where, you know, I part of me wishes that you could just file a trademark for apparel, right? But the trademark office in that class makes you list every item that you're selling. And so this happens all the time where, you know, if you're doing an intent to use application, when you get started, they're like, you know, oh, we're going to sell 50 things, you know, and they list all these things. And then by the time that they get there, they're like, you know, shoes are really hard. We're not doing shoes. Like we're only going to do two shirts and like bandanas. Not even know. sweatshirts. I mean, that's right. it's broken down that detailed. So then you have to, you have to jettison everything else um, to make sure that this thing isn't, isn't uh, subject to, well, what's now, what are, what are we at? Like, five or five different proceedings, five different ways that people could, you know, exit your, your registration, or at least, at least jeopardize it. Do you think it'd be smart to proactively go in if say you, you did register for all of those items of clothing, but then you're only doing say t-shirts and sweatshirts to go in proactively and ask to expunge those other um, items from your registration? Yeah, you can do an amendment and drop things off. Um, you can, you know, the typical time to do it is as at renewal, just to really- Right, but I mean, with this new procedure, could you do that with expungement? Yeah. yeah, you could. Like if, like an example of this would be, if you happen to have one of these, um, a client with one of these foreign or a foreign registration where you have just hundreds of things listed and they're only selling two, you might, you might look at doing your own amendment to delete those things. Um, just, be, just so that if something ever did happen, um, they don't just get rid of the entire registration because, right. well, you know, you might've been doing two things, but 98% of it was not, 
legitimate. So, um, so yeah, that, those are types of things that you'd want to just be careful about. Um, the other place that comes up is, so a lot of times when, if you have design marks, so, you know, for your logo or your, your stylization of your trademark, invariably marketing will change it on you over 10 years. And so, you know, at year three, they'll change the font a little bit. Year four, they'll change like the, sh the you know, the, the layout. And then by the time you get to 10 years, you no longer have something that matches like what the way it's actually used no longer matches the way you started out. And this happens all the time if you're not watching it. And, and that's one where you either want to make sure that you continue using the old version or you're updating and, and to adapt so that you don't end up in a situation where you don't, you're and that's why it's also good to just do plain standard characters. Um, yeah. I, and I, that's my, that's my preference when you can do it. Um, there are some areas where you, you're kind of forced into to doing designs, but for right. sure. So. And you know, the irony of all of this, Justin, is that you need to have all of these things really buttoned up tight in the trademark office. So your, you know, registrations have to match and everything has to be lined up perfectly. But when it comes to litigation, it doesn't really matter if somebody's using an infringing mark in a different class or the same class. If there's a possibility of consumer confusion or likelihood of consumer confusion, that's really the only thing right. that matters. We don't care if you're using a design mark, standard characters, t-shirts, sweatshirts. If, if your goods are confusing with my client's goods, right. then we have a problem. And it is, that it is a fascinating feature where, you know, yeah, you have to be very buttoned up in your, your application. So, but it doesn't really matter that, I mean, the reason you don't want to list like all sorts of types of clothing you're not selling is so that if you do get in a fight, they can't attack your registration. But just because you're only selling shirts and sweatshirts doesn't mean that somebody else is going to get away with selling polo shirts. Like you That's can right. still go after them. And it's still, like you said, it's, it's a messy process on that side. And, and it doesn't impact your ability to, to go after somebody for infringement. It's just kind of making sure that your house is in order. Right. So the, but that's the bottom line, right? You want to make sure that your house is in order, that if you have old trademarks that you're not using, or maybe you're using in a way that you didn't originally intend to use, that you clean it up and that periodically you do a review to make sure that your portfolio really reflects your current business, right? Right. So, so should we, uh, we well, should we answer some of these? We've got yeah. a couple of questions. I don't know. Um, if we run through these. Yes. Do you want to read the first question? Um, so is the, uh, the first question here is, is the trademark office going to go through the register to try to purge unused marks? So this is an interesting one. So under the, under the current act, under these new proceedings, technically the trademark office can institute its own expungement or its, um, or, or even, I think even its own re-exam because anybody could do it. And so I, I have a really hard time imagining that happening. I mean, just with the not, resources that they have. Do you yeah, think? just the resources they have, how backed up they are. I mean, in a perfect world, it would be amazing if you file your application, the examiner looks it up, says, oh, this one's similar. You can't have yours. Oh, but wait, it looks like this is fake. And then the examiner starts a proceeding and cancels that for you. Like that would be amazing. Um, I don't think that's happening, you know, I, I just don't see that happening. I mean, the another question that we got that sort of follows that last one is how fast will the proceedings be and when will they go into effect? Now, it remains to be seen how fast they will be. There is some more flexibility, um, again, without getting too much into the nuances and the details. Um, right now, office actions are six month response time, and there's going to be from some flexibility to shorten that time, but because of the backups in the office and, you know, these new proceedings that are going to be implemented and it's just not clear whether it's going to, um, the, the idea is it for, is, is to shorten the entire process. Um, but we don't know at this point if that's going to happen. And I, they're supposed to, they're, we don't even have the rules yet. So the rules are supposed to be here late, um, late spring, early summer. Um, not sure when they'll be effective. And at that point, we'll have a better feeling for how these are going to work. You know, they're, if they're going to hire new staff to run these, there will be a ramp up period for that. Um, but yeah, it's 
I'm hopeful though that it will be an easier process because you're not going to have two parties. You're going to have the USPTO and the other person, but. And it may be on the expungement side that they use the examining attorneys from the USPTO office. Yeah, yeah it's possible, but the USP, I mean, even the USPTO. So when we first started doing these, these webinars, I think the USPTO was about, you know, a three month delay to when they were examined or until they, you got a first office action after filing. And now it's at like four or five. So they're, they're like not keeping up there either. So I, I don't know that there'll be a good safety hatch there. Right. So they're just going to have to hire more people, but. The next question is, do you expect any changes to IP law with the new administration? I mean, this is a significant change to IP, at least trademark law. Um, again, you know, it remains to be seen until the rules are um, put into effect as to how they're actually going to be rolled out. Um, Justin, do you see any changes on the, you know, copyright or patent side? Or even uh, trade I, I don't know that, I mean, for trademark, um, I don't see a big legislative change coming up. No, other um, than what's already been put into the USMCA and the trademark. Yeah, um, I, I just don't see it in the next, you know, certainly not like the immediate, immediate future, but, um, but you never know, maybe there'll be another spending bill and something come through. Yeah, something so. will be sort of shoved in the back. Um, these are already, as I said, you know, some, some relatively big developments. Um, and I think we're not going to get into, you know, politics here, but I think there are probably other priorities that the administration is focused on right now. Yeah. And, and the trademark office, I mean, for the most part, it is working and they have, this is just one of their, you know, it took them, I, it's been a long, this, this act has been a long time in the making. I'm not sure how long, but, um, you know, this, this problem with foreign registrations has been around for a really long time. And so is this issue of this, this presumption. Um, um, and so, and it, it took so long to get all of that into a single act that it, I don't know that, I don't know who has the stomach to, or what the issues would I don't be. Know, but I, I do think that one of the purposes of this act, I mean, to your point about fake trademarks is really to address the troll problem that has, you know, really continue to grow on the trademark side. Yeah. Um, uh, meaning people who file trademarks just to block other trademarks or don't use them. So um, probably later this year, we'll have another webinar to see how the, you know, implementation of the act has rolled out and what the effect really has been. Yep. So stay well, tuned for that. Yeah, well, I think we're about at time. So um, we will we will go ahead and do that. We, we appreciate you all joining us. Um, and, you know, if you have other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you.